icon is a little nicer for that, as Benno believes too. Um, and <coughs> we're gonna we're gonna teach you some of those skills, and then we'll go into we'll walk you through how to do the same problem we did yesterday, but in Python. And by yesterday, I mean Monday. Is any of this kind of that we do on your website? Yes, we will post all the code. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm also gonna do a little bit about moving around in the terminal. So if you guys are learning that and have any questions or are following along, just jump in and ask. Uh, so before we talk about the particular stuff for linear programming, I'm going to talk about a few general Python things, which will hopefully help. Um, so first, remember cd changes directory. So I'm going to go into the folder where I keep all this stuff. And then ls to see what's there. So I've got the Python script I wrote up earlier and those two CSV files. Um, and I'm going to open those CSV files in the text editor. And so we've got diet problem data. So we've got this first row, which is the names of the columns. And then each column is column separated values, the name of some food, an index, and then the amount of each nutrient it has. And the last one is uh, the cost <coughs> per unit. Uh, constraints is just the nutrients, their units, a minute and a half for each one. Uh, so, um, a couple basic Python things. So I'm going to open up a Python rep one. Um, we're going to be dealing with Python lists, and Python gives you a really easy way of sort of cutting those lists up and taking the parts you need. So if we had some list uh, numbers from 1 to 10, Oh, that's not how this language has been writing other languages. Okay. Um, so the that's telling you is, is yeah, that. you get zero through, through nine. Uh, yeah, so range, if you just give it one number, will just give you from zero up to one less than that number. If you give it a second number, it treats that as the step. So I could do like 100 comma 10, and it would give me every tenth number up to 100. Also remember that uh, zero is one, so we start at zero, not one. Um, so, the way list indexing works is just square <coughs> brackets and then the index you want to look at. So the third value, so when I say three, that's actually the fourth value because lists are zero index. So what should that be? So, okay. uh, so yeah, in this list, the value of position i is just i. So we can grab anything like that. Python is cool that it also wraps around backwards. So if you did list minus one, that's going to be the last element. And that's really nice because if you think about it, otherwise you'd have to find the length of the list and then you'd have to put that yeah, length in. That would be like when list. But if you just write minus one and some other move languages. backwards, it's really, really nice. Uh, so that's how you get a specific element. Let's say you wanted a range of elements in the list. You'd do what's called list slicing. And how that works is you do list from some x to some y like that. Obviously, I haven't defined x and y, so that won't work. But if we did, say, from... 0 to 3, that'll be first one's inclusive, second one's exclusive. That's something you have to remember. Um, that's actually how indexing like this works in almost every programming setting, is that the first, if you're talking about a range, the first value is inclusive, the second one's exclusive. Um, so that's from two discrete ones to each other, so we can do anything like that, just some arbitrary range in the middle of the list. You can also do up to 5, so this will be everything from the first element to the fifth element. Um, similarly, you can do like this, which is from the fifth element on. Uh, yeah, and you can also use the negative indexing here. So if you wanted to just say cut off the last element of the list, that would be from the start to the last element, just cuts off the next. Um, so that's a pretty powerful tool. Um, what else do I want to talk about? Any questions somewhere? Uh, Python to import packages, you do import CSV. Um, there's actually lots of ways to import packages, uh, and they're all sort of minorly different. If I do import CSV now and I want to call functions from the CSV library, I'll do CSV dot the name of the thing I want to do. Those are my options. You can also do from CSV import some specific thing from that package you want. So now instead of calling CSV dot reader, I can just do read. It's just in the global namespace. Um, you can also do something like that, but that'll import everything into your global namespace. 
through your name space is probably going to get messy if you do a lot of that, so use with caution. Uh, and then I guess the last weird one that you're probably not going to ever have to use unless you want to. So you can import something as something else. Uh, sorry. So now instead of referring to things as csv.reader, x is just kind of an alias to that thing I imported. Kind of a niche thing that I probably should have just skipped. So file I.O. Um, how file I.O. works on computers is uh, it's always going to go line by line. Um, so, so this is dealing with, say you want to read that big CSV file we just showed and <coughs> start to make sense of that data, that's where you would need this. So you have that built-in function open that's built into Python. So I'm going to say file equals open. And what does it need? It needs the name and it needs the mode. Uh, the rest of that stuff is optional. Um, so the name of the file, let's say we want to look at the diet problem data.csv file that I have in this directory. And just <coughs> pausing this for a sec, you see that that's in this directory. If it were somewhere else, you would have to qualify the name more fully. Um, so so, so if, if it was in the documents math 317, but it wasn't in the lecture file, you'd need to tell it more specifically where the file's from. And remember, dot dot is one directory up, so that would do that yeah. if it were like fun to say. Um, and then you need to give it a mode that you're opening with. When you open a file, you can open it with as a read-only file, as a write-only, or as both. Um, we just want to read it in this case. So that would be an R. And also this is, for the CSV file, you need to do that U flag as well, which means universal new lines, different text encodings, treat new lines differently. This just makes you not have to worry about that problem. So now we've got that file. That's just the handle to that file. We can call various things on it. Um, those are our options. Uh, but what we're actually going to do with it is pass it into our CSV reader. So we're just going to make a reader on that. Um, what did I do? Oh, sorry. Okay, so you can just name the diet problem data file. Uh, yes. Yeah, file is a, yeah, for all intents and purposes, that file is now, I've named it in a variable called so something different about Python that if you've been exposed to say C or Java, you might you see how we don't say what file is when we define it. If we don't have to say, I don't know. You don't have to yeah. give it type annotations. Yeah, uh, so the variables are really flexible. Uh, which is good and bad. It means you can do stuff like this in a REPL and prototype things super easily because you don't have to write, you don't have to type as much. You don't have to write all of the stupid type annotations. Um, but, but in a large project, you really start to miss the type system and you start to wish that you could just tell what type like, like was. You, you need to very explicitly keep track of what kind of variables you're dealing with because you could define x as an integer or as a float, which is a decimal, or as a string. You know, it all look the same. So, so that's almost the drawback of Python is that if you're just reading code, you have to really know the, the file format that or the the <coughs> type that's coming into each each variable because it's not gonna explicitly always tell you that. Which makes good variable naming even more important in Python than it is in every language. So how do you type test? Uh you don't okay. it Python Okay, I'm gonna go off on tangent about type systems. Python uses what's called duck typing. Uh it's called duck typing because if it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck, then it's a duck. So um, an object has an object is a subtype of another type if it can re respond to every message that that type responds to. So say on int, a uh, like very basic int would probably want to respond to plus, minus, equals, maybe like absolute value. It's got some set of functions that you want it to respond to. The only way of telling if two things are the same type is do they respond to all the same methods? Um, and there's no type annotations like you're used to from Java and C. Um, it's all dynamically done at runtime. If it gets a message it doesn't know, then it says type error. Sorry, I don't know that function. So make sure you comment your code if you use Python because it's just so much easier to read if you know yeah. that that function is going to return a string, for example, versus an integer. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was a pretty big tangent, though, about type systems. Uh, so we're going to pass that file into this CSV reader function. Oh, whoops. And I want to name that something. So I'll call 
are, and in a REPL you can use underscore. If you do something like that, where I forgot to save the value of something, underscore refers to the result of the previous line. So it's going to refer to the question. Yeah, so now. It's reading, it's putting this there. Yeah, so now R is that reader. So R, let's see what methods R responds to. Pretty limited number of things. The one we're going to be working with is mostly next. So, so if you can, could you use like longer names for your things instead of like, you know, file, type file or something like that? Yeah. Underscores uh, are good too. Underscores are good just so that it's clear when you're looking at the text what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> so now this is CSV reader um, instead of R. Um, so CSV reader <coughs> responds to those functions. Let's see what next does. So next takes the next row and it returns you an array. That's what these square brackets mean, an array or a list. Um, and it just returns an array of the values in that row. Simple enough. Uh, so you can keep calling next, and it'll give you the next row each time. Uh, this is, for those of you familiar with Java, this is just like an iterator, just like an iterator. Um, you can also loop through. So I can do something like for each row in CSV Reader, I'm going to do something. Uh, let's say I want to The print. colon is Python's way of having the, the squirrely brackets that you might have been more accustomed to. That just, yeah. yeah. So that's not any kind of <coughs> indexy slicing or anything like that. Right. So let's say print food plus row zero, because remember the first thing is the name of the food. Oh yeah, we can actually see that right here. Um, and then Price is going to be row negative one. So for each row, it's going to say the name of the food and the price. Right? Easy enough. That's just sort of how looping works. And that's a really nice feature of the CSV reader is that you can just loop over it like that. And with a pretty minimal amount of code that I just wrote, just make that CSV reader for each row in it do something to that row. Pretty easy to do stuff like that. Um, how did you get out of the for loop? Oh, uh, white space in Python is significant. So uh, how far tabbed out you are um, changes things. So I can do like for i in range 10 and see how it automatically tabs me out. Any code I write at this level of tabbing will be in this. And you can also just sort of nest that and like say for j in range 2. And now it tabs you out further. And let's say we want to print pair i and j, like that, right? And so now I'm still at the, I'm still within the j loop. So if I press enter again, this will do it automatically. I could also just go down to here and then press enter. What did I do? Oh, they're in some strings. Well, I guess I can just fix that pretty easily. Also notice, uh, small comment, but no semicolons are around. You don't, you don't need those. So I'm just going to convert them to strings so it lets me do this. I'm surprised that didn't work. Uh, yeah, it doesn't do any implicit text. So now I'm back down at my base indentation level. So it's done, and it'll go through those nested loops just by the tabulation, which is pretty nice, I think. Um, so you were naming rows by food and price. Right, you can yeah. back up a little bit, like yeah. a lot bit maybe. <laughs> uh, That's no, I can were you doing the oh, CSV reader that next? You were like going by row? Yeah. But I thought the data was organized by column. So I'm confused. Uh, well, well in the eyes of do dot next again. this programming language, uh, well, there's nothing left because we already used all of it. Oh. Um, this is just a file with rows, and okay. the way that this is organized in a computer is not like. There's a special new line character. It's like not a matrix. It's not a matrix. It's not a matrix. It's just text. It's a text okay. file. Um, okay. And so the logical way to go through it is to Robot. split it up by the new line characters and then pass you one chunk at a time, delimited by those new line characters. Um, and yeah, it could either be, I mean, you could think about it in rows or columns, but the way the computer's going to deal with it is it in rows. Um, so you just take it by, by row of food and you first entry, which is the name, and the negative one entry, which is the price. Yeah. 
if you wanted to think about it as columns, we could get rid of this. So this is like an iterator. You can just say, give me the next thing. And that's the only way of getting data out. We can also, so I'm going to close the file. Oops. Actually close it. Uh, and I'm going to reopen it. Um, so the reason I did that is because now we're back up at the top of the file. Because yeah, when you open a file, you have, you're at some position in the file. When, when you did that for a loop, he had step all the way through. And with an iterator, like, you can't. You can't restart just using it. So if we want to think about it as a matrix, we can say matrix. We can use what's called a list comprehension. So row for row in CSV reader. Um, I'm sorry, let me just think about how to explain this. Um, this basically, for each row in that thing that you're looping over, it gives you a new list where you can do something to it. So like if we wanted just the names, I would say row zero, and then I would have a list of the row zero thing from each row. In this case, I just want a list of all of the rows, so I'm just going to pass it straight through um, like that. And now matrix, this is going to be a ton of output that you're not going to be able to read, but matrix is now a 2D array where the i element of matrix is the i row of the CSV table. So there's the fifth row, and so if you want to get some specific value at position ij, you could do matrix, tell it what row you want, tell it what position in that row you want. So that's whatever that value is. So if you wanted to deal with it like a matrix, you could do that. Um, so I think that's all the basic Python, Python stuff I wanted to talk about. Um, so I'm going to quit out of this REPL. Um, and I'm going to... Anyone have any other questions, if that makes sense? Yeah, so when you did your... Uh, for loop initially that like um, put the labels like in front of each food and price in front of each price. Um, mm -hmm. well, did you have the code like row zero? Was it row, was it row zero or was it row i? Uh, row zero because we, we wanted the we, we wanted the food right. Yeah, we weren't doing any explicit looping of like for i equals zero, i plus plus, i less than some value. We were doing like a for each loop. Um, where we just take each element out of this collection and do something to that element. Um, and what we named that element, the one we're currently working with, was row. Um, I can back up to that uh, if you want. Uh, so like. Also, uh, you know that pushing the up arrow in terminal gets you the pr previous code you typed? That's just, yeah. if you don't know that, so this is, we have some collection CSV reader, and for each element from that collection, name it whatever you want, I named it row, you can do something to that particular element. And this is what I chose to do. Does that so make sense? The foods are and we know just from the way our data is organized that um, the first element of each row is the name of the food. Right, if you look at any of these rows, the first element in that row is the name of the food. Um, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So um, I'm going to start writing some code to do this whole thing. So I'm going to open a text editor. Um, this one is called Emacs, but it's not going to be any different for you. What guys. were you working on before? Let's be Python. Uh, B Python is a spec here. Let me show that, actually. Yeah, so he could um, have just written Python. Python is the built-in REPL. But did you see how he was doing all that auto-completion? Like, oh, I imported right. CSV, and then when I did CSV dot, this thing popped up with all the things I could do. Like, there, right above it. Um, this doesn't do that. B yeah. Python is just a fancier, shinier version of Python. But um, everything would have been the same in this more simple Python, too. It's just for convenience. Um, and if you guys want to get that, I can show you how to get that. It, I think it's kind of helpful. Um, so I'm going to jump back into Emacs. Uh, so what do we need? We need CSV, because we're going to be dealing with those CSV files. It's good form to me to put all your imports at the top of your file, even though you can't just do it anywhere. Um, so, so now we're almost in like the Microsoft Word equivalent, where it's not compiling 
finding a presenter or just writing code. Like, it, it, you could do something similar in R. That's why we're not we're not in the terminal anymore. Yeah. Just um, to be clear. And I'm also going to use this library pulp, which is Python something linear programming. Um, it's, like it's a linear programming thing. library for Python. And I only need a couple things from that. So I'm going to import LP problem, LP variable, LP minimize, and value. I just don't want to import everything because there's a ton of stuff in the library that will get messy. The way, the way we knew we needed those variables is when you're looking for different libraries, you have to kind of look at documentation and see what everything is called. Mm -hmm. So you would never just know something like that off the bat. You have to do just a little bit of research, but it's, I mean, it would have been the first Google search entry, so. Yeah. So first thing I'm going to do, I'm just going to make a new LP problem. Pound is a comment character, so things I write after a pound don't do anything, they're just for documentation. Definitely use them. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to call it problem, and it's going to be a new LP problem. And what an LP problem takes, it takes a string, which is just the name of the problem. Not really sure why it does that. I think that's kind of weird. But it's what it does. So it needs a string. And you need to tell it either to minimize or to maximize. In this case, minimize. Um, so if we wanted to maximize, I would have imported LP maximize instead and passed that as the second argument when I made the problem. And we're going to And you would know this is what it, it needed based on the documentation. It would be very clear. Yeah. Um, or uh, the first time I write code, I very rarely write it in a text editor like this. I'll use a REPL and then sort of port it into a text editor. Um, so if I had been in my text editor trying to do this, uh, I would have done problem equals LP problem. But it's poorly documented. Oh, there we go. So when you start typing in this REPL, it tells you what arguments it takes. It takes name and it takes a sense. Um, and it tells you some stuff about those parameters over here. So if you're confused about something, pop into a REPL, see how it works, play around with it. Um, yeah, so I don't actually want to do that. So I'm going to jump back over there. Yeah. So we have that new problem. Um, then we want to open the data from both CSV files because we're going to have to use it. So uh, open both CSV files. So we'll call one data reader, and that's going to be csv.reader. Remember, our constraints um, in our dad problem things were in two separate files up there in the top left corner. So before they were separated. And I'm going to do the same thing for the constraint reader. So now we have a handle on both of them. Uh, we don't, but the meaningful data is just everything after the first row, because the first row is just the names of the columns. So I'm just going to pop off the first row of each of them. So data reader dot next, and that just remember reads through the first column, and I don't want to do anything with it. I just want to get rid of it, so I'm not going to assign it to a variable. Um, same with constraint reader, pop off the first column. So. Then we're going to go through and sort of deal with the data from each of them in turn. We could do it in either order. I'm going to do the, actually we can't do it in either order. We're going to do the data problem data first. So what do I want from this? I want a list of variables. I want a list of nutrients from those variables. I want the costs for each of those. I want the name. And that's it. So I'm going to initialize all four of those things to empty lists. He could have he could have written this out as four separate lines. He could have said variables equal square brackets, nutrients equal square brackets. But with the commas, you can just do it cleanly in one line. Yeah. Because it's easy to see what's happening there, so it's nice to just get it on one line. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to loop through each row of this CSV file. Remember, each row, if we look back at our data, corresponds to a single. Uh, food that we can choose, and then it tells you all of the information about that food. So for each row, first thing, oh god, what's it doing? Um, that makes me think I screwed something up. We'll see. Right. Um, just the tapping is weird. Um, for each row, I'm going to make a variable for that row. Um, so 
variables dot append. That just means stick it onto the end of the list. And what do I want to append? I want to append a new LP variable. And I happen to know that the arguments to LP variable are a name for the variable, a minimum, and a maximum. Um, so, so append makes the list longer yeah. by how much you're putting on. Just, just if you had like one comma two Append only takes three. one element. Yeah. Uh, okay. yeah. yeah. But so if you append like takes one, the list an element, sticks the element onto the list. Yeah. yeah. Making the list longer. Um, so it needs a name, a minimum, and a maximum in that order. So the name, I'll call it x, and I want them to be like x1, x2, x3, so I'm going to add on to x, uh, what is it, the, so the index of the row we see is the second element. So our first food is broccoli, our second food is carrots, oatmeal cookies are our 20th food. So I want the row for our i food to have a variable called x sub i. So to do that, I'm going to say x sub, and then I'm going to stick onto that list also uh, the second element. Remember, it's zero index, so one is the second element. So that's the name of our variable. Then I want to give it a minimum of zero because you can have a negative amount of food. And I don't want to give it a maximum because we can have as much of each food as we want within reason. Uh, also, just yeah. so you guys aren't confused, the little slash at the end of each oh, okay. line, that knows typing an enormous font. So that's just coming from the fact that it's wrapping around. Yeah. You're probably not going to be typing in font this large. So that, that's just a function of having it. Is good. this easier to see full screen, or do you guys like having the data there on the side? Doesn't matter? OK. I'll keep it full screen so it doesn't wrap like that. Uh, down. So that's what we get a variable. And then we want the nutrients information for this particular food. And so the nutrients are from the third element, where's my mouse, there it is. Uh, from the third element, which is calories, up through the second to last one, which is iron. So to get from the third to the second to last, remember we talked about slicing a little at the start. That's going to be from two, which is the third, to negative one, which is the last. So we're putting off the first and second. And that's going to be row. Um, one thing here, when you read in from the CSV file, it just treats everything as strings. So what we know are numbers, it's actually just thinking of as a string with decimal characters, right? Uh, so I'm going to convert each of those strings to numbers. The way I'm going to do that is I'm going to map a function float over that list. You don't really need to know what that is how, or how it's doing it. Basically what map does is it takes a function and a list, it applies that function to every element in the list and returns the resulting list, right? So if you applied the function squared, square this number, to the list 1, 2, 3, 4, you would get back the list 1, 4, 9, 16. So what we're doing here is mapping this function of float, which converts something to a float, which is a decimal floating point number, is what it floats, uh, and then applying it to each string in that thing of rows. Does everyone know the difference between like a string and an int and a float? No? OK, so like a string is if you had names or if you if you just wanted for it to show text. So basically what's happening here is all of our numbers are stored as text and it does not meaningful to add text together. So you need to convert like zero as a character to zero as a number or three point one four um for from like the the string version to three point one four as a as a number as a a decimal number. Does that make sense? So, as a concrete example, 0 plus 5 obviously is 5, but the string 0 plus the string 5 is the string 0, 5, right? So, we want to be thinking of these things as numbers, not as strings of text. But so, the way we do that is in, it's going to come out as a string. Float of 3.141 is just going to give us back the number. Uh, so, that's what we're doing. So, similarly, if I had this list of numbers, and I had 3.141 and 2.5 or whatever. And if I mapped, so map takes a function and a sequence. It's telling us here. And I want to map the function float, which is the one I just used on the line above when I did float of 3.141, over that list. Now it returns a list of the actual floats. So that's all we're doing here. Um, so I'm going to pop out of there. Does that make sense? Pop back. Uh, onto the list of names, we're going to stick the name of this food, 
easy enough, and we're fine with it as a string, so we're not doing any conversion there. And then onto the costs, we're going to append the last element, which we do need to convert, but it's only one thing, so we don't need to map over it. We just need to do it to that one thing. Um, yeah, so now for each row in that CSV with data, we've taken that row, taken it apart, taken all the data out that we needed, and stuck it onto these lists. So when this loop is done running, the ith, the ith variable will correspond to the ith row in that nutrients table, will correspond to the ith cost and the ith name, if that makes sense. So we can just sort of, if we know the index, we can look in each of these four lists to see what the data is about that food. Um, cool. Then what we're going to have to do is make our constraints. So, um, so for each row in in new oh, in constraint reader. So, this is if I wanted to go through each row of the constraint reader, but I also want to know what row number I'm currently on. Um, and the way you do that in Python is you say enumerate some collection. So you want to have an i. So now instead of each thing being a row, it's going to be the index of the row and the row. So I'm going to call that index comma row. Or I'll call it row num. Yeah, the first thing is the uh, index and the second thing is the actual element. I'm going to do that. Um, yeah, so we're going to want a min constraint and a max constraint. More of those are going to be equal to. Uh, so we know we can get the min out of the constraint reader. That's just uh, the third element, and the max is the fourth element. So I want to make a constraint, but it's not going to have any variables left because we're going to have to loop over the variables to find them. So the way you would make a constraint, if you had some variable x less than or equal to 5, right? That would be the variable x is less than or equal to 5. <coughs> if x is one of these LP variables. But we can't just do 0 is less than or equal to 5, because it'll evaluate that and it'll tell me, yeah, 0 is less than or equal to 5. True. So that'll be a Boolean value, not an expression. But I want the expression, or not expression, the equation, 0 is less than or equal to 5. So just a little ugly solution to that. 0 times one of our variables, let's say the first one. So now, instead of doing the actual comparison, it's going to treat this as an expression. The expression 0, not the number 0. That's just a little hack to make this work, um, to make me be able to declare an empty constraint. Is everyone following that? Does that make sense? Um, and we don't actually want five, sorry. We want a float of the third element in the list. Is the max? Oh, right. sorry. It's got to be greater than <coughs> or equal to max. Right. Isn't this the main thing? Uh, yeah. We want to be greater than or equal to our min, less than or equal to our max. Did you see up in the top left, you have calories, and then CAL, and then 2,000, and 2,250. So the third one corresponds to the min. Is there a specific to how you float for it and not? Is it for each of the individual decimals? Well, because if you didn't have float, you'd have, in the first row, you would have uh, 2,000 and 2,250 as strings. It would be the string oh, okay. two zero zero so, so zero, not the number two thousand. Float is a function that takes. You can either give it a string that's some numbers, a period, some numbers, and it'll give you the corresponding decimal number, or you can give it an integer, and it'll just stick point zero onto the end of it. Okay. Um, and there's similar ones you can. There's a lot of built-in typecast functions like that in Python. You can do float of something, int of something, string of something. And does it go like a generic number of decimal places? Or uh, for all intents and purposes, yes. If you need super precise mathematical computing, you wouldn't use these built-in floats because they're they're only thirty-two bits, so there's only so much precision okay. they can have. Uh, but it's definitely good enough for definitely good enough for us. For our diet if, so if you're defining zero times variable zero as like an empty variable, um, what are you? I don't know, like what's being checked then as you go through. Oh, so these constraints aren't done. I'm going to oh. add variables <laughs> to these constraints. I just want to be able to make an empty one at the start. Okay. Um, and you'll see why. I'll explain why when I show how we're doing it. So then, for each of our actual variables, so for i in range length of variables, 
Um, so that's for each index of the variable. Does that make sense how that works? Yeah, so if the variable is the list five long, length would give you five, and range would give you zero, one, two, three, four. Yep. Um, so onto min constraint, I'm going to add the ith variable times that. So what that's saying is we're going to stick onto our constraint for the ith variable. We're going to look at how much nutrients are in that ith uh, variable, that ith food. And we're going to take the row number one. So if our row number is, say, five, and we're looking at like sodium or something, then what that's doing is it's going into each of these variables, and it's looking at the fifth nutrient, which is sodium. Does that make sense? So we're going to add that onto min constraint, and we're also going to... So plus equals means that that's the same as writing min constraint equals min constraint plus the variables of i times nutrient. It's shorthand for doing that. So you're, you're increasing mid constraint by y with the right hand side expression. That's what that means. Yep. You're not overwriting it, you're increasing it. So the reason I had to declare these outside of the loop is because if I declared them inside of the loop, well, I'm going to need them inside the loop, but I don't want to redeclare them every single time I go through the loop because that would be useless. We want one constraint that we loop through and add something to each time. So I needed that empty constraint at the start. Um, so now we've added all of those variables to a constraint. So when the program reaches here, those two constraints are done. We can just add them onto the problem. Uh, min constraint problem plus equals max constraint. So we're going to add those two constraints that we just built onto our problem. So when we've gone through each of our foods, we've added a constraint, or sorry, each of our nutrients, and we've gone through we've added a constraint on the minimum amount we can get of that and the maximum we can get of that. That's all we need. We're done with our constraints. So now the last important part of the um, linear program problem is to have an objective function. So we're going to need to add an also, objective function. to remind you, remember, problem was the uh, LP reader. Like, we didn't, we haven't used it in a little bit here, but we have already defined problem. Oh, yeah, I defined and we that. defined it as Wait, the, the LP problem. Okay. Remember this empty, and empty. Just so you're not confused. Yeah, um, yeah so now we need to make an objective function. So, objective function, again, I want, um, I want a zero expression. Uh, I don't want the number zero, I want a zero expression. So I'm going to multiply zero times some variable. This is ugly, and I bet there's a better way of doing it, but it's just a simple, easy way of doing it. Um, it would be nice if in the library there was something that said empty expression, empty constraint, something like that. Um, so yeah, sometimes you're going to have libraries that you like most of, but there's really annoying aspects, and, and that's just the trade-off between, you know, you don't want to write the code yourself, so sometimes you have to constrain to what the library does and make your stuff work to what it does, and this is an example of that. You, you know, you could also spend like an hour trying to find a different library to do the same thing, but sometimes it, it, it would take longer to do that. Mm -hmm. so there are other libraries in Python that would do something very similar. Maybe some of them don't have this ugly step, but they also might have their own drop max, so it's And also, pulp is pretty nice if this is our biggest thing to complain about. Yeah. Um, it's a pretty good library. Um, so what we're doing here is we're making the objective function. We're looping through our variables, which is looping through our food, and we're adding for each uh, variable, the product of its cost and how much of it we had to our objective function. Pretty easy. And then we're going to add that objective function to the problem. And, <coughs> excuse me. So how this LP problem works is you can add any number of constraints, and those constraints are uh, equations, inequalities. And then you can add a single expression at any point. So it treats all of those inequalities I was giving it as constraints. And then when I give it an expression without a less than equal to just a single expression, it knows that that's the cost or the objective function. Um, so that's why you get this really nice syntax of just problem plus equals your constraint, your objective function. So that's all we have. So now we've given it all of our constraints. We've given it our objective function. We've formatted it the way we want. We can tell it to solve.
So now it'll have solved, and um, to pull that data out, having solved it, uh, you can call value on any of our variables. So once you've solved, each of those variables has a value. So if I did now value of variables five, that would tell us how much of food x5 we have, the value of variable x5. I want to go through and do that for all of them. So for each variable, uh, And there might be some rounding errors, something, it might tell us to get like one one millionth of some food or something. So we want to check if the value of that variable is greater than some re reasonable rounding error. So something like that. Then we want to print it. So we'll print names i, so the ith food's name, uh, and how much of it there is. So a little arrow, and... And the ticks, if you're not familiar, that's just, that's going to be a character. That's not some operation we're doing. That's just visual. Uh, oh, and I like when things... By ticks, I mean quotation marks, sorry. I like when things line up, so I'm going to just pad this to 20, length 20. So if it's a string of length 10, this will just stick 10 spaces onto the front, so everything lines up nicely in our output. Um, and that's it. So unless I made any typos, this should run. Um, so, so now I quit out of my editor, and I say Python, and I pass it the name of the file I want to run. I just named this diet problem code.py. Um, and I made a typo. So this is, no, this is good, this is what happens. Uh, so I'm gonna go back in, and it said that it was on line nine. nine. So I'm gonna hop to line nine. Oh, I missed a close print there. Yeah, and makes sense why that's why it didn't... Yeah. Oh, man. That's why it wouldn't indent automatically for me the whole time, is because it thought I was still in this... So Python's really good, and if it's not automatically indenting stuff, you should probably check your stuff. So <laughs> don't expect automatic indentation in any text editor. That's a special thing in this text editor. And if you're using Sublime, it won't have that. Which is a good reason to not code in, like, Notepad or something, but using email. Yeah. And also the shading really Yeah. Nice. Though actually, if you had done this in this, in, for those of you using Sublime, you can select all of your text, Command Shift P, re indent. Just a side note, and it'll indent everything automatically for you, if that makes sense. Uh, so for those of you guys using Sublime, that might make your life a little easier. Um, so I think now with those closed prints, everything should be good. Uh, so I'm going to hop up to run this. And it tells us everything. Uh, Again, we can judge Katie's uh, <laughs> diet. <laughs> I like how carrot says comma raw. <laughs> it doesn't tell us the cost. It doesn't tell us the cost. We could. You, haven't, you haven't had an output for the cost. We don't know how much it's going to cost to keep Katie eating like a queen. Uh, queen. There's a function in pulp that you can call. Yeah, there's a built-in thing to do that. I did eat, I did eat you think popcorn is like popcorn. pretty empty too? Uh, there is definitely a library function in there to do it. Mm -hmm. I can look it up and find it out, but we're almost out of time. Uh, did I send yeah. you the article by uh, George Danzig on when he first solved the diet problem, first ran the calculations? So his wife was basically waiting for him to call home and tell him and tell her that she should buy from the supermarket for dinner that night. And there were small little mistakes. So I think we're done. We'll quit recording. And so I'll, I'll find the article and share that with you. But they had put in basically like zero calories or zero, or zero cost. I won't do it justice. I will leave it to you to read later tonight what the diet was. But it was not. Uh,